49ers rookie cornerback Darrell Luter starting off this training camp on the pup list. How would that impact his rookie season? The show quarterbacks, it is renewed. And I'm going to tell you why I feel like Brock Purdy would be the perfect candidate for that show. And Alex Smith, a lot of positive words for Brock Purdy, on Brock Purdy, and how he feels like he's a perfect fit for Kyle Shanahan's offense. We're going to talk about all that more right here on Locked On 49ers. Let's go. You are Locked On 49ers, your daily San Francisco 49ers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to another episode of Locked On 49ers. I'm your host, former NFL and AFL defensive back, Eric Crocker. And as you can see, I'm riding solo. Got my guy, Brian Peacock. Nice little vacation, but don't worry, I'm going to hold it down. I almost feel like uh, Captain Phillips, where the guy was like, look at me. I'm the captain now. Well, I'm the captain now. I'm running the show, all right? Uh, hope my guy, Peacock, is out there having fun. We definitely still want to thank you for making us your first listen of the day. And really jump right into some... Some cool little topics, all right? Now, breaking news, Darrell Luter, rookie cornerback out of South Alabama. He's headed to the pup list. And I first saw this on Twitter. Shout out to David Lombardi for reporting this. He was all over it. He says the 49ers designated rookie defensive back Darrell Luter Jr. as a pup physically unable to perform per the NFL's transaction wire, all right? They can place Luter on the active slash pup list at the start of training camp. The pup list is open to players who suffered football-related injuries in the offseason. All right, a player can be activated from this list at any time. So what does that mean going forward, all right? I'm going to assume at some point he'll be healthy. The injury hasn't been disclosed. I have no idea what it is right now, all right? But regardless of that, I can talk a lot about the cornerback position and how really kind of missing that time, how it impacts you. Okay. We're talking about a guy right now who potentially is competing for a starting spot. I think we're all confident that Diamond Lenore can hold it down. Traveris Ward can hold it down as well. But as we've seen with the 49ers, there's injuries all the time. Guys are banged up. And really at that other cornerback spot with Diamond Lenore, as much as I feel like he fits what Wilkes wants to do very well. You, you never know, all right? He, he's, he, had never, he has never gone into the season where it's like, hey, you're guaranteed to be the starter. Really like what we see from Traveris Ward. So I always felt like, you know what, there's going to be a nice little competition in training camp, and Darrell Luter might make things a little interesting. Well, with him out and not getting those very, very, very meaningful reps, to me, that is kind of a big deal. Right now, the 49ers rookies are reporting for training camp. And in my experience, when the rookies reported before the veterans, we still have practice. And it was great because I was able to get a lot of reps that you don't typically get when all the veterans show up. So just so you know a little bit of how these reps kind of are allocated to some of these guys. All right, first string, and look, 49ers might do a little different, but with the New York Jets, first string got about five reps. Second string, they'll get about five reps. First string gets another five. Second string gets another five. Third string finally gets in, and they might get three. And you have to make the most of those opportunities. And I don't know where Luter is right now in the rotation, but I would assume he's closer to third string than he is first string, all right, because you still have guys that have been there. And obviously there's two cornerback spots, but Samuel Womack, you know, where is he at? Ambry Thomas, where is he at? Those are guys that have been there for now, going on year two and year three for Ambry Thomas. Those guys are going to be in the mix to potentially compete. So, Darrell Luter, you want all the opportunities to get whatever reps you can get. Now, fortunately for him, his situation was a lot different for me, so it might not be that much of a transition with him being able to kind of jump in there and catch on to things quickly. Look, I went to a Division II school and then went to the Arena League and then went to the NFL. The verbiage was drastically different. What I was asked to do just in the defense as a whole, I came from a school that they would call cover two, they would call some sky cover three, but the, the New York Jets and Rex Ryan defense was a little bit more exotic. So I go there and things happen 
quick. The way that you have to count receivers from the outside in, you know, you got one, two, three. Is there three to your side? Is there two to your side and the back? You know, does a guy motion away? If he does, how does that change your responsibility? And those were things that were kind of difficult for me to catch on right away. And you just need those reps. And, and you kind of need to mess up at times. And, and then you need to do well. You need to learn from other people's mistakes. And I think right now with Luter, and starting off on the pub list, he's probably going to have to learn from other people's mistakes and not be able to make his own. And hopefully he's taking a lot of mental notes. I think for him, while why it won't be as tough of a transition as it was for me is because at South Alabama, it sounds like some of the verbiage and the way that they played defense was similar to the 49ers. So now it's just, all right, how does Wilkes want you to do this? What does he want your alignment to be? I saw Luter playing a lot of catch technique when he was at South Alabama. Do they continue to let him play that kind of defense with the catch and obviously play at the line of scrimmage? Before that, play a lot of off coverage. You know, are they going to ask him to backpedal out, stay square, as opposed to playing more catch, which he was used to doing at South Alabama? So those are all things that you want, they you would want your coaches to see, hey, man, what's going to be the best way for this guy to win the rep? And when he's not out there, it's just really hard to kind of get in that groove and understand how you need to play for you. So I think that's where it kind of hurts him. Now, what exactly is this injury? I have no idea. So hopefully it's not something that is going to hinder him long term, maybe a lower body injury like, you know, a high ankle sprain or something that might have him out a month. You know, again, these are very valuable reps for a young guy that's coming into a defense. And we didn't really hear a whole lot of noise from him in rookie minicamp or just veteran minicamp and OTAs. Not saying that that means anything, but it just means, hey, we didn't hear a lot about him, all right? So this was a great opportunity for him to, you know, start to get more reps as the rookies show up first. And then once the veterans show up, see what other guys, you know, kind of hit and miss on and learn from their mistakes, he's going to lose that. So it opens up. A lot of opportunity for some of these other guys to just get more reps at the cornerback position. Guys like, hey, Samuel Womack. You know, I'm excited to see what Womack does year two. I think early on in year one, it was very clear to me, this is a guy that has some legit versatility, being able to play outside, being able to play in the slot. But he had a couple of interceptions against the Green Bay Packers. Where was he playing? He was playing on the outside. And I thought he played very well there. I know he's not the biggest of guys, five foot nine, but really long arms. He has long arms as long as a guy that's 6'2", 6'3". All right, runs in the four threes. I think he can run with those guys vertically on the outside. But the 49ers, for whatever reason, said, you know what? We're going to play you in the nickel. Maybe they just want their best 11 on the field, and they felt like putting him there would just have him on the field. Well, after week two, he was benched. And I got some DMs saying, well, he's kind of benched because you know, he just – that isn't great in the run fits yet, which, well, yeah, he's playing in a completely different position than he was in college. L listen, going from an outside cornerback predominantly throughout your, your career, all right, to playing in the slot, especially at the NFL level with everything that they're asked to do, that makes it tough. You know, how many guys are to your side? And, you know, is it one? Is it two? Is it two in the back? Does the back motion away? How does that change your responsibility? Does Two, motion away to the other side. How does that change your responsibility? Do you have to go with him? All right, does that change how you run fit? Do you now all of, all of a sudden have to blitz? There are all these little changes that go in. And for a guy that has multi, ultimately played on the outside and now sliding into the slot, this is a lot that's thrown on guys. I remember uh, talking to DJ Reed, and he was talking to me about that, where DJ Reed, he was an outside cornerback at Kansas State. Next thing you know, 49ers are like, oh, we're not going to play you outside. We're actually going to play you in the slot and not just in the slot, at safety as well. He's like, man, what the heck? Like, I, I've never played these positions. I've been an outside cornerback. 49ers try to force him into something he wasn't, and he never had as much success as he probably could have had. And how do we know what kind of success he could have? Because he just signed a, what, $33 plus million dollar contract with the New York Jets to play, you guessed it, outside cornerback, all right? So Samuel Womack, put that guy on the outside. You got guys like Isaiah Oliver to play in the nickel. You got, uh, gosh, I don't want to, Hartz, Hartsford, Hartsford, Hartsford? I keep banking on his name or uh, messing up his name, but the corner says safety that the 49ers got from the uh, Carolina Panthers, all right? That's another guy who's going to kind of be in the mix for some playing time, especially in that nickel spot. So Darrell Luter, 
It's a missed opportunity right here. We're going to see how he recovers from that. All right, next up, we're going to talk about Brock Purdy. And I'm going to talk about why I believe Brock Purdy is the perfect candidate for that new Netflix show, Quarterback. All right, you guys aren't going to want to miss that. But first, I have to talk to you guys a little bit about our good folks over at eBay Motors. All right, they're our partners now, and they have teamed up with Locked On Fantasy Football host Vinny Liar to bring you some of the best fantasy picks each week all season long. Whether you're preparing for the draft or scouting the waiver wire every week, we're going to provide you with players that are guaranteed to fit on your roster. So with the draft prep underway, Right now, for the upcoming season, let's see who Vinny has picked out for us on this week's eBay's Guaranteed Fit Fantasy Picks this week. All right. So, if you're looking to make that smooth turn into fantasy football snake drafts with the last pick in the first round and the first round pick in the second round, all right, you will be guaranteed to have a winning one two punch of a workhouse workhorse power back. All right, in your backfield. All right, how about Colts? Jonathan Taylor. I think he's going to be there. And Browns, Nick Chubb. Take them back to back. While Taylor is a perfect rebound candidate and he has more run-friendly offense overall in Indianapolis, Chubb is also set up to be very dominant as well. And he can, you know, combine with the workload over there in Cleveland. That's two guys that would be very good for you. Now, let's say you want another option. Okay, how about C.D. Lamb, A.J. Brown? I think those guys are perfect fit at the end of the rounds. You can count on Lamb driving Dak Prescott and Dallas's new look, passing offensive game to big numbers, and Brown reviving up Jalen Hurts down the field, throwing often again in Philadelphia. We saw what they did last year, man. Those guys were cooking. Maybe you want one more option. All right, we'll go Devontae Adams and Patrick Mahomes. Those guys should kind of be there, and those are guys that you all want to take over there at the turn if you are drafting late in the first, but early in the second. With eBay guaranteed fit and over 122 million parts and accessories for your vehicle right at your fingertips, you can make sure that your ride stays running smoothly, whether it's air filters, brakes, batteries, taillights, alternators, uh, your shocks, your struts, you name it, eBay Motors, they have it. And they'll make sure that it's right fit for your car because eBay guaranteed the fit helps you understand exactly the part of the vehicle that you need the first time. So go forth, switch gears, crank the AC and say goodbye to the sweating if your ride needs a little fixing up. All right, because now you know you'll always be set up for success from the get-go with eBay's guaranteed fit Everything your vehicle is calling for is just one click away. So for the parts and accessories that fit your vehicle, just look for the green check. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices at ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. I didn't mean to say that like uh, Russell Wilson, Broncos country. Let's ride. All right. eBay guarantees a fit only favorable to U.S customers only available to u.s customers eligibility items only exclusive exclusions apply all right i had to get through that right there shout out to ebay motors but we're going over to the opposite side of the field for the 49ers and we're going with brock purdy quarterback listen i watched this show on netflix it was amazing i thought it gave great insight to the quarterback position now this is something by i want to say peyton manning He has something to do with it, all right? And right now they're saying that DocuSeries quarterback will be renewed for a second season via Peyton Manning on the Pat McAfee Show. Quarterback premiered on July 12th and quickly gained popularity consistently uh, ranking among the top 10 shows on Netflix. According to the Sports Business Journal, the debut of the series marked the fastest start for any Netflix docu documentary series and it's like well of course you have Mahomes you have Cousins you have Mariota and Brad's football so when you look at kind of the lineup that they had you had a great quarterback with Patrick Mahomes you had a kind of a middling quarterback with Cousins then you had Mariota trying to kind of make that turn and when you look at kind of how they had that whole thing set up I feel like Brock Purdy is kind of the perfect fit for that type of show why he's a guy who we saw play extremely well 
in the games that he started. As a rookie, a guy didn't get a whole lot of reps in training camp, didn't matter. Uh, started off the season as a third-string quarterback, didn't matter. When his number was called against a terrific Dolphins team at the time, didn't matter. All he did was put up a bunch of points and continue uh, to average what? The offense average or the team average, 34 points or so over his start. So, I mean, the, the scoring went up like a touchdown per game. And Brock Purdy, his just ability to continue to move the sticks, make plays, all that stuff factored into the 49ers being really good offensively, and he did a great job with that. Now, unfortunately, he got hurt. And I think this is the intriguing part where I think it could be a really good and intriguing show as it pertains to him. Recovery from that elbow injury. I think that's something that's going to be really big. I think that's something that's going to be talked about a lot. And I would love to see them dive into kind of the process of that. All right. Right from the time that their report for training camp, what is he look? What is he doing? You know, what is the conversation like around that? How do 49ers feel about him uh, with that injury and how they go about it? Let me see the behind the scenes there. And this thing doesn't stop at training camp. It goes throughout the year. So whenever he does start to step on the field, we're talking about a guy on a team that has very high expectations. And I think they have very high expectations for Brock Purdy, and deservedly so after how he finished the season. So, you know, a winning team, a young quarterback, uh, a polarizing organization with the 49ers, I think this is a match made in heaven. I I want to see it. Now, this is kind of a – I don't even want to say it's a hard knocks because it's not, it's not like hard knocks. And if you didn't watch it, you're missing out. It's a great show. But they really just dive in to the, the, the player specifically, not, you know, everything around him, not – they're not going to be – talking a whole lot about Adebo Samuel or Nick Bosa. It's really quarterback specific. And you just get to hear, you know, how they think, how they memorize plays, uh, what goes into their recovery, you know, injuries, man. And, and watching Kirk Cousins, I'm like, man, this guy is tough. He's tough. He was getting beat up, got sacked a ton in that season, getting up, ribs all hurting. And you watch that just how he tried to recover. People he had coming to his house to help kind of fix him up so he, they can doctor him up and get him through an actual game. It was really good insight from all those. And I think one of the cool things that, that I saw, there were a few actually, especially with Kirk Cousins, one, just how he prepared. This is a guy who listened to play call. Who did he get it from? He said who he got it from. I don't remember exactly who he got it from, but what he did was he recorded himself saying the plays, calling the plays. And then anywhere he was driving, he would press play on that and listen to himself call plays, and then he would have to visualize the play in his head. So that kind of helped him set everything up. And just hearing like just that little detail, I thought that was really good. Well, I want to know Brock Purdy's detail. All right, I want to know just how does Brock Purdy go about his preparation in like during the week. Patrick Mahomes, they show Mahomes a lot and how he works with his trainer from elementary school. Matter of fact. He moved his trainer from elementary school, the guy he had been working with, you know, strength, performance, and everything, moved him to Kansas City. Hey, come be in Kansas City so I can see you three times a week. And, you know, at the end of the day, at night, he'd go get with his trainer and really work on, you know, his mobility, his twerk. And I'm not talking about throwing the ball. I'm talking about the physical part of it, uh, you know, be, becoming more explosive, ramping, ramp, ramping up into during the, you know, end of the week. And what that looked like, I was like, man, this is really great insight. Then you got to get a little bit more personable with all of these guys. You see Kirk, Kirk Cousins, the type of husband he is, his wife, how his wife dresses him, you know. And he was such a, like, great down-to-earth guy. I was like, man, this is really good insight. So I started to like Kirk Cousins a lot more. I still think as a football player, like, he's solid. It didn't change my perspective on that. You know, he's a – nine to 12 kind of guy. Maybe you can put bump him up a little bit higher than that. Some people might have him, you know, top seven, maybe eight quarterback. He's kind of in that range and probably won't ever be anything higher than that. But I didn't change my perspective on him from that standpoint, but definitely just the person, the human, the, a lot of these players do, you know, charity work. When you watch him do his charity work, how just how genuine he was. And he comes across as just this, Normal guy. Didn't have this huge, flashy house. He's made a ton of money in the NFL. He can buy any house he wants. 
but the house wasn't crazy flashy or anything like that. It was just a normal house, a normal basement. He put his stuff up everywhere. And, you know, he had his little office with all his memorabilia there. And listening to him talk, it's like he's aware of how people feel about him. But it's just like, man, there's nothing I could do about it. And he had a great quote. It was from someone else. I can't remember exactly who the quote was from. But he quoted and said, you know, if everyone saw me walk on water, they would tell me it's because I can't swim. And I thought that was a great take. I say all that to say, I want to learn more about Brock Purdy, who he is. I know he's a guy that just got engaged, and I don't care too much about his, you know, at-home life. But just to learn, like, who is this guy that potentially might lead the 49ers in the future? And aside from that, is will there be a quarterback battle? How will, you know, will there be some ups and downs? We watched Mariota on quarterback. Eventually, he ended up getting benched for Desmond Ritter. You know, when something like that happened where Brock Purdy just, I don't know, comes down to earth, doesn't play well, gets benched for Trey Lance. And what does that look like? And then them follow that. So great stuff there. I'm hoping that they add someone like Brock Purdy and add him to the mix with other guys as well. Like, uh, I don't know, Brock Purdy, Jalen Hurts, uh, Dak Prescott, or Justin Herbert, or Joe Burrow, you know, one of those guys. I'd be really excited to see that. When we come back, we're going to talk some more Brock Purdy because – there's a guy that really liked Brock Purdy, and he goes by the name of Alex Smith. All right, so Alex Smith has some really good things to say about Brock Purdy. We're going to get to that next. But first, I want to say thank you for making Locked On the NFL Draft your first listen of the day. And for your second listen of the day, listen to my guy Brian Peacock and Matt Williamson. All right, they got the Peacock and Williamson show. They come at you five days a week. They're on YouTube. They're on Spotify. They're on Apple, so you can find them anywhere you listen or watch your podcast. All right, guys. Brock Purdy, Alex Smith. Let's talk about some of the things that Alex Smith had to say about the young quarterback. And this was pretty exciting stuff because we we know what Alex Smith went through as the San Francisco 49ers. Really tough times, especially early on. He dealt with a plethora of different coordinators and coaches during that time. I want to say seven different offensive coordinators in seven years. Like, come on, man, can't nobody be, you know, successful kind of going through that. He had years where his best receiver was Arnez Battle, and no disrespect to Arnez Battle, but, you know, he wasn't Debo and, you know, and Brandon Ayuk and those guys. He did have my guy Brandon Lloyd for a little bit, and I was a big Lloyd fan at that time just watching the catches that he made. But anyways, he didn't have Debo. He didn't have Ayuk. He didn't have those guys. He didn't have uh, Christian McCaffrey in the backfield. But he did talk about some of the things that he feels like makes Brock Purdy good and the things that are hard to quantify. And I think all of us are trying to figure out, like, man, what makes Brock Purdy as good as he is? And I would have to say, you know, just maybe some of the things that you can't quantify. So let's read a couple quotes from Alex Smith on how he felt about the young quarterback. So in our interview process at the Combine, you know, they have all these weird tests that you take, and they haven't really found a great way to quantify that, Smith said. Uh, and I think Brock showed he's got the right stuff between the ears. All right, it's not too big for him. This is a guy I know didn't get many reps in training camp. He finally got uh, back up to number two, so he's running the scout team. Uh, you are still not getting many reps. Now, that's something very key because I think a lot of people, when they start thinking about, like, you know, kind of the development of these quarterbacks, they assume that they're just getting all these practice reps. They're not. <laughs> Their reps are coming from scout team. And when you're the third string quarterback, you ain't getting much of that. Second string quarterback, you're kind of running the scout team. And then once you become a starter, obviously everything kind of goes through you. So early on, not getting a whole lot of reps. All right. So, uh, and then he steps in and he just operates the way that he did. It wasn't too big. You could see him dial in. All right. So, a lot of positive words there, just the guy was ready for the moment, for however he prepares, which that's why I want to see him on quarterback. All right, and he says, and I know in that system, there's a lot on the quarterback's plate from a processing standpoint, and I think he showed that absolutely he's got it. And again, height, 40, arm strength, that stuff really is secondary at the NFL level, and I think he's got the things that you are looking for to win substantially. Again, accuracy, timing and processing. 
says those are like the main things that Kyle Shanahan needs. And I think Kyle kind of has echoed those sentiments a little bit, right? When he's looking for a quarterback, and we've talked a lot about that, he just wants somebody, man, just throw the ball where I want you to throw it and be able to execute that way. And I've talked about him maybe not liking Patrick Mahomes because Patrick Mahomes is more of a second reaction quarterback, right? You listen to Alex Smith, what does Alex Smith say? Uh, you know, those things are secondary. Well, that was kind of how Patrick Mahomes kind of lives off a lot of that. And even when you watch this show, Quarterbacks, you'll see Mahomes, it's a lot of the other things that probably makes him great. Being able to throw off platform, late and downs, uh, scramble, big runs down the field. He really stresses the defense out with a lot of that stuff. Kyle doesn't care about that. He wants you to drop back, back foot hit the ground, get the ball out with timing and rhythm and be accurate. All right. And those are all things that I feel like Brock Purdy truly excelled at. And I think that's what makes him such a good match for Kyle Shanahan. But even more than that, it's the processing. And I want to note one thing from Josh Allen and his development. We talk a lot about Josh Allen as it pertains to Trey Lance, just because, you know, just the physical tools. And I don't know if Trey Lance's tools are as physically gifted as Josh Allen's, but just, you know, bigger quarterback, big arm, you know, can throw the ball all across the field, whatever. But the one thing that really helped Josh Allen, this is me talking to my guy, Greg Pinelli. Greg is really close with Josh Allen. They're kind of like brothers. It's like Greg is like the big brother. Josh is the little brother. Anyways, he was a guy that kind of helped him with all his scouting stuff throughout his time at Fireball uh, from the junior college standpoint. Then even going to Wyoming, he always continued to help him. And he still trains him now sometimes in the offseason when he's not working with uh, Jordan Palmer down in Southern California. But Josh Allen, from what my guy Greg Pinelli told me, you know, y'all remember, it wasn't very great early on. And it was very sporadic with his accuracy, et cetera. Well, a lot of it had to do with his processing, believe it or not. Everybody said, oh, his feet and everything like that. I'm like, yeah, he had to improve those things. But ultimately, a lot of it had to do with processing. So he was trying to catch up with everything really late and then fire these, you know, fastballs in there thinking he can fit those passes into anywhere. And he just couldn't do it right? Because he's really late on a lot of stuff. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sounds kind of like, uh, I don't know, a guy by the name is Trey Lance. But anyways, what really helped him was, you know, just the reps, seeing defenses, starting to understand, you know, guys rotating late uh, and, can, you know, messing up and improving on it and then continuing to work on his mechanics and things like that. So by year three, he had been in the system for two years now with Brian Dayball, knew what to expect from him, Played so much, knew what to expect from defenses. So now those late rotations didn't bother him. And that allowed him to play more freely with his technique and not as tight and really kind of let him be, get loose as well. That was another thing Greg said. It was almost like he was trying to be another quarterback at the start of his career. And that wasn't quite him. So he had to play a little bit more loose. But he also was able to play more loose because he was able to process a lot better. What was, what he was seeing from the defense, knowing where his guys were going to be, and then just everything came together. Well, it took him three years to get that down. It took Brock Purdy, what, the, a half a season on the bench <laughs> and not even playing. And he steps in and he does those things from the processing standpoint. I think Kyle Shanahan is probably like, heck, yes, I'm going to struck goal with this kid just from you know the mental ability to be able to process those things. Now, you also have to have some ability. And we saw guys like Nick Mullins. I think Nick Mullins probably processed well, but just, you know, wasn't as talented when things had to break down a little bit. And I think that's where Brock Purdy has the edge on Nick Mullins, who I think Mullins was able to, you know, throw with timing, be accurate, do those things. He couldn't make the plays off script when it wasn't there. And I think that's where we see Brock Purdy really had the edge. Now, I know people are going to be like, Nick Mullins. Hey, man, there were times where people were really high on Nick Mullins and thought he was the second coming of Jimmy Garoppolo or, or whatever. And clearly, he didn't turn out to be that. And maybe it could have been supporting cast, uh, the defense around him. You know, he didn't have Christian McCaffrey. He didn't have a lot of those guys. Matter of fact, Debo's out. George Kittle's out. I don't know who the heck he was playing with. Kendrick Bourne? Brandon Ayuk? Brandon Ayuk had one of his best years there. But – Ultimately, he wasn't really winning games. And you look at Brock Purdy, and he's in a great situation. And as long as he continues to have this kind of cast around him and understand how to play from the neck up, the things that are really kind of hard to quantify for coaches, 
I think he's going to continue to be terrific for your San Francisco 49ers. All right, y'all, good stuff there. That's going to do it for this episode of Locked On 49ers. Again, I want to thank you for making us your first listen of the day. And for your second listen of the day, come on, man, Locked On. And for your second listen of the day, you got the Peacock and Williamson Show. Check out my guy Peacock over there. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. All that good stuff. But that's going to do it for this episode. I'm out. Peace. Subscribe to this video.